beautiful place. It's really difficult to give the first scientific talk after all the warm greetings and then from the video, right? I'll try to keep my energy as much as the hopefulness of the, of the video, but I can't guarantee that. I'll do my best. Um, I did want to share uh, some stories with you. Uh, I loved the, the, the logo, and so I tried to model uh, some of the work that I'll be telling you about related to biological interactions, DNA, and also some stories uh, related and inspired by uh, colleagues uh, Luisa and Sarah. So that's in there just, just, just for you two. Um, but I was interested in uh, understanding how uh, we can find more about how um, um, nanoparticles and other types of agents interact with, with the body. And, and what we need to do, though, is to understand it at the single particle level and, and in real time. And what the, the real time uh, enables us to do is, is it enables us to use uh, optical microscopy, it enables us, us to use light to interrogate these types of interactions. Uh, and so as a, as a broader scheme of what we're interested in, um, this is a, a hard problem in health, is if there's a, a localized tumor, what goes into the design of making agents to treat that uh, locally? Because most of the time, the delivery uh, is systemic. Uh, there are different, lots of different types of delivery mechanisms related to IV injection, inhalation, uh, pills. And this is a, a big global problem. Um, but the second problem is, uh, so we don't want all of the agents to go throughout the body. We would like it to be able to target specifically where there is a, a disease state. And if, and if, we, if that's possible, then um, there are less uh, side effects in the development of a therapeutic. But the third uh, challenge is, can it, from the systemic delivery, can it actually deliver what it's supposed to do if it actually makes it to the target? So you can see that as we're uh, interested in starting from something very, very large, getting to something that's very, very small, layers and layers of, of challenges. And so there's a second delivery problem once you actually get to the target. And, and then the fourth large problem is whether once it's made it, uh, if it's delivered to, to the target, to the tumor, to the cell, does it maintain its mechanism of action? Does it actually work after everything that it's uh, gone through uh, at the site uh, of uh, interest? And then finally, um, at least in our application, since we're mostly focusing on inorganic nanoparticles, uh, we might care about whether they clear or not. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different uh, problem from example, for example, than uh, biological nanoparticles like uh, liposomes uh, or polyplexes have. Um, so today I'm going to focus on, on this second delivery problem and also uh, whether the particles with their cargo can maintain their mechanism of action. And part of the reason why we like um, nanoscale science to address biological problems is because their length scales are commensurate. Uh, molecules are on the order of sub-nanometer, and you start building up into the size of biomolecules like DNA, which is a couple of nanometers, to proteins, which are five to 10 nanometers. And as a synthetic uh, scientist, we can actually mimic some of those types of structures, and in fact, start to probe them at their relevant length scales. So for example, understanding how nanoparticles are taken up into, into cells. You notice that all of these, there's all sorts of different mechanisms. I won't go through the details here, but all of these are at the, the nanometer scale, whether uh, they're clathrin uh, uh, mediated uh, indicytotic processes, where these vesicles are on the order of 100 nanometers, or whether even uh, these other smaller vesicles form depending upon um, uh, the induction process. But besides these other types of steps, uh, we are able to, to fabricate, we and others in the general community can, can fabricate uh, nanoscale structures on a surface that can also start mediating uh, biological interactions. So for example, if the, uh, these particles, if they're spaced very, very close, uh, there's a lot of collagen that can be uh, introduced. But if they're uh, farther apart, then the, the collagen uh, fibers are also farther apart. And it turns out these types of substrates can be used to start uh, differentiating uh, stem cells while, while these cannot. So just by controlling the nanoscale spacing, it's an important uh, advance. But the challenge here, if we're talking about 100 nanometer scales, is that it's very difficult to follow these dynamics in, in real time because we're limited by uh, diffraction. So we need, we need to start to develop new types of tools that can uh, probe these types of problems. And the, um, the probe that we're going to use is related to uh, gold nanoparticles. 
And part of the reason uh, related to this meeting that we're interested in gold is because it's light responsive, and I'll focus on those properties as, as they emerge. Uh, but gold in particular, if you can put um, therapeutic uh, ligands or biological ligands uh, around the surface, there are, distinct, uh, dis there are a distinct set of advantages. The first is if, if we put DNA or RNA along, around the surface, it improves the stability against uh, nucleases because these types of uh, biological molecules will tend to be degraded by enzymes. Um, there is also a uh, demonstrated higher uh, cellular uptake through the endocytotic process through a process called uh, multivalency. There's this three-dimensional presentation of DNA ligands on, on the surface, and because of their multiple interactions, they can be taken up more efficiently. And finally, uh, by attaching uh, therapeutic ligands to a scaffold such as a sphere or, or a star, the DNA and RNA functionality is, is enhanced. But there are other questions related to, well, what happens if you have a, a star type shape or a three-dimensional shape compared to, to a sphere? And, and there's very uh, little uh, work done on comparing these types of effects, but part of the reason it's really important is because of what we know about the shapes of the most effective viral agents, for example, the, the coronavirus, just that we've all just been uh, subjected to, they have anisotropic uh, features on their surfaces. And these anisotropic features actually make a big difference on their effectiveness at infection. And so we're interested in these types of ideas too. Uh, and today I'm going to be focusing on uh, a couple of them. Uh, what is the difference between this type of shape and, and this type of shape related to uh, binding and uptake into cells? And then does it matter whether uh, the ligands on the surface are, are targeting or non-targeting? Uh, and we like this particular scaffold for uh, a couple of different uh, reasons. First, it has a uh, positive curvature at, this, uh, at these tips. It has these negative curvature regions, and there's also this uh, neutral curvature, curvature region. And the idea is that the local nanoscale structure can give rise to, to macroscale chemical and physical properties. So by controlling um, the, not, the, the presentation of the ligands, as well as the shape of the scaffold, we can get these macroscale uh, effects. Oh no, maybe it's died on me. Okay, and, and in terms of taking advantage of the scaffold, these different regions uh, affect the ligand loading and their overall construct properties. So for example, in these uh, positive curvature regions, there are these high local optical uh, fields, but also the, the ligands can splay out and they can present. And so they can uh, have high density and preserve their functionality. In these uh, neutral regions, uh, because we use uh, gold thiol chemistry, we get a tight packing of the ligands on the surface, which also acts to protect against uh, unwanted degradation from nucleases. And in these uh, negative curvature regions, if we're using DNA, uh, we have these uh, hydrophilic pockets, but also in these negative curvature regions, you can control the local pH. So just by controlling the local pH and the, uh, because of the way that the ligands uh, interact with each other, um, this is a, a really nice way to, um, uh, to achieve chemical control at the nanoscale. And then finally, uh, what I want to talk about is how this anisotropic shape is beneficial as a single probe for what we call multivalent uh, structural interactions. So for example, not just the interactions that happen at a single tip, but interactions that can happen when you have multiple tips uh, uh, binding to uh, a cell surface at the same time. Okay. So how do we make these uh, wavelength-dependent uh, optical probes? Well, we started uh, backwards. We wanted uh, the synthesis to be as green as possible, meaning we wanted it to be as uh, biocompatible from the very beginning. And so we only used uh, two different uh, reagents. We have a HEAPS buffer, which is commonly used in, uh, in media and biological applications, and we start with uh, the gold salt. And it's a room temperature uh, reaction, which is easily scaled. This is five liters uh, of nanoparticles. And if we evaluate low resolution uh, transmission electron micrographs, uh, you can finally see what I mean by the length scales are commensurate. So for example, they're not all identical because we make them through a, a, a process that doesn't require a seed, but these, uh, these branches taper down to about uh, two to five nanometers in the radius of curvature. So now, this is the size of a protein, which means in principle, each of these branches can just bind to a single protein, which would be a big deal if we're interested in how uh, single units interact with single proteins on surfaces. <laughs> 
Um, in terms of the, the what the heaps buff, what the goods buffers do, it, this is heaps, and they mostly have branches that are equal. Uh, in length, and as you change the relative ratios between the gold salt and the concentration of the goods buffers, we systematically shift the, the uh, what's called a localized surface plasma resonance to longer wavelengths. But because most of the branches are all the same, there's one broad uh, resonance. Um, if we change the goods buffer and we make it uh, out of heaps, there's just a single uh, carbon, we add a carbon to this chain between the uh, piperazine ring and the, and the sulfonate group. And you'll notice that there are now two different resonances, uh, two different wavelengths that these particles are responsive to. The shorter wavelength uh, corresponds to these shorter branches, and these longer wavelengths correspond to these uh, longer branches. So this is really nice. In a single uh, particle, we can take advantage of short wavelengths for imaging, or, or uh, stimulation or long wavelengths for imaging and stimulation. And what I like about this, this is what sort of where the magic of chemistry comes in. These molecules are, are functionally similar, except just an additional carbon in the chain. Um, but what that does is it forces the, the particles to grow in different orientations. So for example, the heaps particles grow along the 111, and the east particles grow along the 110. Um, and a second, and a, not a second, a third uh, goods buffer that we have evaluated is uh, MOPS. So we still have this uh, sulfonate group. In, in this case, instead of a piperazine ring, we have a morpholine ring. And these also grow along the 110 uh, direction, similar to the EEPs. But they also have these two uh, different uh, uh, wavelengths corresponding to these, uh, these classes of uh, branched lengths. And so this is the story that, um, it's sort of an interlude story, but I, that I sort of like this as a collaboration. And this is what the meetings are, are for. If the, when we see the video, these face-to-face -face interactions, this is a collaboration directly as a result of talking to Luis and also <laughs> talking to Sarah on who can we help, who can we collaborate with that can help us understand the growth mechanism of these structures. And this is uh, Dr. Sarah Balls. Um, so as I mentioned, these particles, they look sort of, um, they're really nice in terms of length scales, but they're sort of weird looking. I mean, they're not like these beautiful poly, polyhedra. And we also make them, just as I mentioned to you earlier, we, we just uh, take the goods buffer and we take the heaps and we mix it all together and it's at room temperature. So of course we're gonna have uh, a distribution of shapes, but also these are very uh, distinct ones that come out of this process. Uh, and so we can't exactly do this in real time, but we, can act, we, but we can try to get snapshots of what's happening in terms of the growth mechanism. So we quench the growth at these different uh, time scales. And you can see that just if we're evaluating kinetics, that the heaps particles uh, reach their final state much, much faster than the EEPs uh, nanoparticles as well as the MOPs nanoparticles. And we quench them with a, uh, with a peg, uh, with a peg thial. And you can see that it takes a, a while. So uh, it takes, um, uh, this is at the, the structure after 30 minutes, if we're growing with these uh, EEPs uh, uh, goods buffers, till we get to this uh, final structure. And then they just stop growing. You can, they can keep growing and you can let the reaction go longer and longer, but they uh, end up arresting at a, at, a, at a final state. And so what we wanted to do was to evaluate the distribution of these, uh, of these shapes. And so we came up with these non-technical terms to describe shapes. Okay. I normally don't like these, but this is just sort of the best that, that we could do. So that we have this uh, squared shape where most of the branches are identical. We have this other type of structure, with long, one long branch, this boomerang shape, uh, tripod shape, and this four branch shape. And this is where we start to do uh, statistics. So if we evaluate all of the particles, and these are like thousands of particles, so you, we develop these codes to an, help us analyze them. The majority species in the heaps is this uh, square shape, where most of them have branches of the same uh, length. Um, if we evaluate the distribution for these E particles, most of the shape is this uh, boomerang uh, shape, where you have these long branches and then a couple of tiny branches. But if we evaluate the MOPS case, you can see that the boomerang branch and the one branch are almost exactly, or are, are very similar in terms of, of population. And if we uh, can, can uh, look at now the, the time scales, uh, of how these uh, grow. We have these beautiful tomography movies, so I figured I would um, share them uh, with you. And uh, these are these uh, final shapes, uh, as you see, and it may be not a surprise that uh, these grow along the 111 directions and these grow along the 11, uh, primarily along the 110 directions. And this is what the branches look like after an hour. <laughs> 
Okay, but if we look at the very beginning, they have to start from something. So the earliest possible time that we could quench the growth to, to look at um, the, the subsequent uh, stages uh, of development, if we look at the heaps particles, this is what the initial seed looks like. This is the fast Fourier transform, and uh, at the high resolution, then it's the same that, that we saw related to the 110 uh, directions. But if we look at the EAPs and, and the, and the MOVs particles, you can see even from the very beginnings, this is the earliest uh, uh, quenched uh, structures that we could evaluate. After six minutes, you can see that the EAPs have, the, have these uh, twins, twin planes within the particle. And even for the MOVs particles, there are, are multiple uh, twin planes from these very beginning particles. So partly what this tells us is that the very beginning particles will help us uh, understand the final shapes that we get. So if you understand what the initial uh, seed structure is at the very beginning, you can anticipate what the final structure will look like. And uh, this is just a, a combination of these high angular uh, and low angular uh, stem, uh, angular dark field stem images. Let's just see if I played, played the movie. Um, and you can see these uh, multiple twin planes in, in the MOPS, uh, earliest MOPS particles and these uh, appended twin planes in, in the EAPS particles. So it's a, it's a story that says, okay, well, if, and it all goes back to the beginning. If you can control the incipient particle, or if there's a way to control the synthetic conditions to control the initial particle, then it dictates the, the, final, uh, the final growth. Okay. So I, I wanted to have another uh, interlude. Maybe it's just a story of uh, uh, vignettes today more than anything else. Is uh, how can we take advantage of these positive curvature areas that I mentioned that have radius of curvature less about three to five nanometers, but also how do we take advantage of, uh, of light? And, and this is uh, in line with uh, this, uh, the hope, okay. We're interested in taking gold nanoparticles and placing different ligands with different functionalities in very specific places. Um, and it m might sound like that's straightforward, but actually that's a really hard problem because we're relying on gold thiol interactions. So if all the gold thiol interactions are the same over the entire uh, surface of the particle, how can you put specific sequences of DNA or different types of um, functionality at different locations? Well, the community has been working on this uh, for some time. This is an example um, from Oleg uh, Gon's group. And his approach was to use uh, phase segregation. So if he uses phase segregation and a couple of different types of ligands, so he uses non-DNA hydrophobic ligands, you can effectively block specific areas on, on the surface, and then you can put uh, different DNA sequences at the sites that are unblocked. The challenge with this, even though it's uh, elegant, is that you cannot discriminate between different, different DNA uh, oligonucleotide sequences. So for example, you couldn't put uh, different ligands here than you put here. That's just not possible using these methods. And there's been uh, other recent uh, elegant work by Hanati uh, Sliman's group at McGill where uh, her approach is, uh, well, okay, we have an isotropic uh, particle. Can we uh, have these DNA cages or these DNA uh, templates where we can locally uh, stamp on or transfer what's on the, the template to the gold nanoparticle, different strands of uh, oligonucleotides? And this is what she did um, using uh, this uh, approach. But then to visualize it, um, she separates these out using uh, gel uh, electrophoresis, but you need to know what population of, of uh, these superstructures do you actually have. And so uh, the, the really nice approach here is to be able to uh, uh, bind the complementary DNA strand attached to a gold uh, nanoparticle. So these tiny little particles act as a, a marker that the functionality that you wanted to have, it was able to be achieved. Okay, so we wanted to use a, a slightly different approach from these uh, approaches, and we wanted to take advantage of the structure of these uh, star substrates that I've introduced. But in order to do that, we needed to make sure that we could quantitatively load uh, DNA and RNA on the uh, surfaces. And I should mention that uh, quantifying how much uh, biological ligand you have on a nanoparticle is super boring. I mean, nobody wants to do it. Um, because it's not that interesting, uh, actually, and it's, it's very, very hard. But from the perspective of someone who wants to understand 
how does the particle that you design interact with, for example, uh, a cell surface, you have to know that quantification. So we've spent years doing this quantification. And it turns out we can control the number of ligands uh, pretty well. We also have to do what's called this uh, citrate buffer method because DNA backbone is negatively charged and it's not really easy to just um, have very high uh, densities of DNA on a surface. So we use this citrate method. But the other thing that we needed to know if we want, want to know how nanoparticles with ligands interact with, with cells, is whether the ligand uh, in free solution acts as the same on the surface. Does it present the same? Because if it doesn't, you've done all of this hard work to make these probes, but they don't actually give you any uh, useful information, or at least the information that you had anticipated. So we also did circular dichroism to ensure that, for example, the duplex stays a duplex, the, the single-stranded uh, uh, DNA stays single-stranded, and these uh, G quadruplexes, which are folded aptamers, they also maintain their G quadruplex structure. Okay, so how does light, um, how can we take advantage of light to be able to uh, control where DNA ligands uh, go? Well, as I mentioned, that these particles uh, support localized uh, surface plasmon resonances, and in this case, this has this long branch shape, um, and this long branch has a, a localized plasma resonance around uh, 800 nanometers. These are some uh, calculations that indicate most of the uh, energy is localized uh, at the tips, very close to the tip. Especially if the polarization of the light, these are finite difference time domain simulations, is along the long axis. Um, and this is what the, the, um, the absorption looks like. And so what this means is if we can have light that comes in with the polarization at this particular wavelength, then we should be able to selectively remove DNA from these sites. And uh, there are a couple of different ways that could be related to the mechanism that I won't go into, uh, but we have determined that if you use femtosecond sources of light, not continuous wave, continuous wave will heat up the particle. But if you use a femtosecond source, then you can cleave the gold sulfur bond, and only at this site will the DNA come off. So this is pretty nice. You have DNA everywhere, and then wherever you have uh, um, at these uh, tips, the, the DNA will be uh, released um, by breaking gold sulfur bonds. And so we quantified uh, how much release that, that we could get. And as you might expect, as you increase the, the power and increase the, the time of the duration of the light excitation, that you'll have more DNA release. So at four seconds compared to 10 seconds, you get significantly more DNA release at 10 seconds than, than four. And this tracks it at higher and higher powers. In general, we want to use as low power uh, as possible, however, because at high powers, then the particles can start to reshape, and we don't, we don't like that. Um, but the other interesting thing is once we can release the uh, DNA at specific uh, locations, uh, we can, on a one-to-one -one basis, refunctionalize now that bare uh, tip with a different sequence of DNA. Because the chemistry is all the same, we're relying on gold silver chemistry, but now we can put a different, which is labeled this DNA2, on the site that's now bare. So we use light to release the DNA, and then now we can functionalize that empty bare part on the gold with a different sequence uh, of DNA. And if we do everything uh, correctly, the amount of the second DNA strand that we want is the same as the number as the DNA strand that was released. So it's a one-to-one. -one. It's actually pretty, I, I think it's actually pretty neat. We have to go through some steps to ensure that um, uh, that happens. And that's with the cell functionalization. Okay, so, but we wanted to do a control. We needed to do similar things to what uh, Hanadi did in her experiments with gel electrophoresis. I mean, we know that we have a second DNA on the, on the particles because we can use fluorescence. If we label the DNA, we know that uh, uh, just by quantification that there is a DNA, uh, a second strand of DNA on the surface. But the problem is um, we need to know, first of all, whether it's functional and, uh, and whether it's in the locations that we want, right? Earlier, I just showed you the cartoon, okay, DNA comes off and other DNA comes in. And this is where we use electron microscopy. So this is the new DNA, DNA2, that we added, and we need it to image it with a, a, a tiny uh, nanoparticle. And we use a, 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 an, an intermediate strand in order to be able to do that. So the first step is we want to test the functionality of this new uh, DNA. So we have DNA on the particle surface, and does it, does it function uh, as we expect? 
And then second, uh, can we uh, image this in uh, electron microscopy? So the control experiment is, if everything worked as uh, we anticipated, then there should be uh, little gold nanoparticles everywhere. And, and this is what we see. So we have all of these little gold nanoparticles that are about the same distance. They're not gonna be absolutely the same distance in these two dimensional projections, but they're about the same distance from, from the particle uh, surface. So it shows us that we can use this uh, uh, intermediate uh, DNA linker to test, test the functionality of the gold, uh, of the DNA that was added. And so in this case, what we did is, okay, we have DNA everywhere, and then we, we just release it at the gold, uh, at one of the tips. And then you can see that uh, these are images that all the particles are at the, at the tips. You'll notice that they're not at every single tip. And, and the reason uh, for that is this uh, technique is polarization uh, specific. And if you're not at the right polarization, for example, uh, then we're not gonna be able to release uh, DNA from, from these specific sites. But it's actually, uh, it's actually pretty good. Whoops. Okay. And so what, what the, part of the reason I'm uh, introducing this uh, vignette is that uh, this is the first example of, of sort of what single particle uh, analysis is about. Single particle analysis relies on statistics. And if we don't do enough statistics, we might be misled on interpreting some of the results that we see. And so this is just the real reality of nano. <laughs> okay, we can design everything um, perfectly uh, on the bench top, but we can't have a, a mole of nanoparticles. They're not all uh, identical. Um, but we can reach for the majority. And so this is what uh, I think is really nice about this. We analyze you know, hundreds of particles for each of these different steps, and then indeed the the, the majority, or at least you know, 75 to 80% of the particles as we design them are as we expect. So we're pretty satisfied uh, with that. Okay, so let me tell you about the, the main thrust after all of these uh, vignettes on using these uh, uh, particles to uh, interrogate biological uh, interactions. And the, the real-time uh, method that we're going to use is an optical method, which is uh, based on differential, differential interference contrast microscopy, which is a wide field uh, technique. And it's also uh, diffraction limited. And so the question is, how are we going to get nanoscopic interactions from a technique that is diffraction uh, limited? And, and this is where the probe uh, becomes really important. So, for example, I won't go into the details of the, the mechanism of how DIC works, but just to point out a, a couple of, of factors. So this uh, technique is polarization sensitive, and if it's polarization sensitive, then that's really uh, good for using anisotropic probes, um, which like these uh, nanorods or these gold uh, nanostars uh, are. And moreover, um, because you're uh, filtering out whatever light source that you want to use, the, the light wavelength that you in, use to interrogate these interactions can be uh, centered on the localized surface plasmon uh, resonance. So which that means is if you have different uh, particles of different sizes, you can get different information out because you can focus on the wavelength of, of interest. Um, and these are two examples of what the... Um, of how these uh, images are, are generated. So for example, uh, this is what is, is on the CCD camera. Um, and I'll, let me tell you how, the, how, how, you, how it was started. So for example, a bright pixel uh, will change the, the phase uh, of this one beam if uh, it's oriented as this uh, horizontally, as you can see uh, in the laser pointer. And by the time uh, all the interference occurs and it's recombined, there's a bright spot. However, if the particle is oriented vertically, because they're polarization sensitive, the optical response is, is sensitive in this way, then by the time all the phase shift occurs and it's recombined uh, to it through the analyzer, then the pixel is uh, dark. So just by looking then at what this uh, overall image is, um, because we know the orientation of this initial polarizer, we can determine the local orientation and position of a nanoscale particle, which I think is really uh, quite interesting. And so this is what it looks like. Um, um, these are frames from a real time uh, that I just have still shots for. 
uh, of, of if the particle is oriented this way or the particle is oriented this way, you can just uh, pick it out here. So it's rotating. This is in real time. It's in a microfluidic channel, and the particle is rotating on a surface. And if you pick out this uh, bright spot orientation, because we know the uh, orientation of the polarizer, we can associate that with a particle uh, oriented along this direction. Similarly, you see all of these different, uh, these different colors, I mean, sorry, different contrast, and then it becomes this dark spot. And we know because it, if the dark spot that it's oriented um, in the uh, 90 degrees. So by looking at what these uh, far field images look like, you can, we can understand and build a library on what the local orientation of the particles are. And similarly, the three-dimensional structure works in the same way, as long as the three-dimensional structure has a long branch. You'll notice that it's either bright or it's dark, but there, there are extra features around the, the center, if you will, of the, part of the image that indicates that there's a, you know, all of these other structures around. But it's still dominant by a single uh, uh, bright or, or dark spot. And so the, the challenge with using a, this uh, uh, technique to be able to resolve uh, uh, interactions in real time is, uh, is, is the cell, okay? So this is a DIC image of the cell, and you'll see that there's a, there are a lot of features. So how, how can we discriminate all of these features um, when we're using the, the same uh, light source to excite and follow the particles? This would be much simpler, for example, if we labeled the particle with uh, fluorescent dye molecules, because then at least you have a couple of different uh, channels. But we want to be able to watch these processes over um, the longest we've done, I think, is 48 hours. And so we need to be able to have a non-cytotoxic way to uh, follow these processes without killing the cells, uh, or the, especially with light not killing the cells. Okay, and these are the problems that we want to work on. We want to uh, work on real systems. So the, the, the ligand uh, of interest that we're focusing on, it's always a drug ligand. Uh, some of them are in uh, clinical trials and some of them have just been uh, discovered um, through uh, in research labs. Uh, we want to put this ligand on, on the particle, so we design this construct, and then we want to interact with a specific uh, biomarker. So this is very specific, the aptamer is specific, and the, the biomarker is also very uh, specific. Some of the studies that we're working on uh, focus on um, membrane express receptors, such as HER2 and, and nucleolin, and other ones focus on receptors that are inside the endosome. Um, and in this case, this is a, an adjuvant but it's still a, a DNA with a specific function that's on the surface. So I'll start out today talking about HER2, which is uh, overexpressed on many different types of uh, cancer cell membranes, as well as, uh, as, well as nucleolin, which is ubiquitous. Uh, actually, yeah, it's ubiquitous on almost all types of uh, cancer cells, which is uh, a little mis mysterious, actually. Okay, but the, the question that uh, we encounter uh, a lot, and actually the community encounters, is, I just showed you these cartoons that are perfect, right? You can get these uh, uh, protein structures from the protein uh, data bank. Uh, we did all the quantification uh, of ligands on the surface. I told you about many years uh, doing that. The orientation works really well. But um, the reality is uh, on, the, on the cartoons and on the bench top, it's not quite the same when you put it into a biological uh, system. It's actually pretty messy. And this has been an Achilles heel in the nanobio community for, for a while. Because as soon as you put your beautifully engineered particle into serum, for example, or into blood, or you inject it, uh, there's nonspecific uh, absorption of, of uh, proteins. There's just a range of proteins. These are just electrostatic interactions. And so there's been some work on how you can work really hard on to design your nanoparticles, but then uh, the protein corona, um, these nonspecific absorbed proteins, they just, you know, they obscure all of your hard work. Uh, similarly, these are uh, more single particle uh, interactions. Um, the molecular structure dictate of, the, of the protein corona tends to dictate a lot of the, the properties. And then this really nice article um, uh, that was just uh, published uh, this year, I think did a nice job of analyzing the, the literature uh, and doing some um, statistical analysis on how we understand the, the protein uh, uh, corona and what its effects are on the, whether the particles that we design on the bench top, they actually um, function as we'd expect. 
Um, and so the, liter the, the literature is still, um, hasn't solidified on an answer for this, but it's also limited about uh, on targeting interactions. Most of them have focused on shape effects, but not, not targeting interactions of the, of the particles. And so this are the, these are some of the fundamental questions that we wanted to resolve. Uh, but the first uh, course of action is we need to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that the ligands that we put on the particle, that they're functioning as we expect. So we uh, functionalize the surface of this um, nanostar with um, what we call an H aptamer, which is a trimeric version of the a 14 uh, mer uh, sequence. We didn't invent this. This was published in 2013, and they started to do um, some trials with these um, uh, with this trimeric version. And, and this is another case where the uh, the multivalency matters. For example, if we just have this uh, sequence that's in red, that will bind to the, the cell surface, but there will be no therapeutic effect. But as soon as they evaluate, and these, these are in humans, as, they, as soon as they evaluated the, the trimeric version, then it not only binds, but the therapeutic effect is induced. And so we can see that if we bind a, a Psi3 labeled aptamer, that we get uptake into, into cells. Uh, we also found that uh, that the cell viability is decreased substantially if we evaluate the same amount of, uh, hurt, uh, of aptamer as, as the free aptamer. You notice that there's a very little decrease in the uh, cell health or disruption of the cell metabolism for the free aptamer, partly because of nuclease degradation. And the activity of this aptamer is to crosslink and sort uh, HER2 to, to the lysosome for, for degradation. Okay, so we also compared the, the free aptamer versus uh, the aptamer again on the nanostar. And if you just look at the fluorescence, where it's a secondary antibody stain uh, for HER2, there's much less HER2 on the, on the cell surface. So it looks like the particles are doing something. Um, but then, of course, we need to, to do the, uh, the Western blot to actually quantify whether the amount of HER2 protein that we want to take from the surface and take to the lysosome for degradation, whether that's really uh, reduced. And indeed, uh, it is. So the reason I mention all of this to you is because we're using optical microscopy to look at these uh, interactions. And so we need to establish first that the interactions are robust. And so that's what we did. So they, they are robust. They, they uh, respond biologically as we would expect. OK, so these are these DIC images of, of live cells. You can see it's very easy for us to differentiate the bottom plane, the middle plane, and, and the top plane. And we can also uh, watch this uh, and characterize, whoops, characterize this uh, rotation in, in real time. And then we correlate this with the scanning electron micrograph images. So for example, the particle at the long axis is in the horizontal direction. It's bright. The, par uh, the particle is mostly in the vertical direction. And then it's mostly dark. Okay, so this is how we quantify it with this, what we call contrast difference. Um, and the first uh, test that we wanted to compare was we have this targeting nanoconstruct, so this H aptamer, and then we want to compare it with a non-targeting construct, meaning does it retain the, its targeting effects or, or not. So the non-targeting uh, DNA has the same length and it has the same charge. So the only difference is, the, um, is, the, is whether it can bind to HER2 or, or not. And if you look at the, these different uh, time points of the translation, uh, it's pretty different. So at these targeting nanoparticles, they span a large range of area on the surface, but the non-targeting, it's very uh, confined. And then if we evaluate this uh, in terms of the, the rotation, we see that for the, these uh, targeting particles, not only do they span a wide range of translational motion, but they also undergo a very fast rotational motion. But if we compare to these non-targeting, not only does it not move much on the surface which it's bound, but all of the rotational motion is very, very slow. Uh, so what this means is we can use either translation or rotation in this type of uh, dynamic assay to determine whether a particle has the function or, or not. And, and this will be really important as we're trying to evaluate other different types of particles. So just by looking at the, the, the target, just by looking at that translational or the, or the rotational motion, we have an idea of whether um, the construct is behaving as we want or not. And I won't go through a lot of these details of the translation. We fit it to these uh, mean squared displacement models. Um, but the, the point I, I do want to, to mention here is that uh, the extracted confinement length, and we get this uh, length out from this uh, restricted uh, diffusion, 
is that it's within the, the range of um, uh, her two domains on, on a surface. So the length scales that we get out through this uh, dynamic assay gives us a specific and relevant biological information. And this is the, uh, an example of, um, one of the first examples actually of the endocytosis of a, of a, of a single nanoparticle. It's been, I mean, it took you know, over two years for the, to try to understand how the coronavirus how can be internalized into cells. And actually, there's not that much information on what happens to what's involved in this process in, in real time. And by putting, uh, using nanoparticle probes, um, this can be resolved uh, directly. Okay, so let me let, just let the movie uh, play out and then I'll, I'll, I'll describe what's happening. Okay, so the nanoparticle is outside and you can see it's rotating. It's flickering between bright and dark, so it's moving. It's rotating over 90 degrees. And then uh, what happens is that it stops rotating. So it, it's, it's, it's arrested its motion, and then after it stops rotating for a while, then it starts uh, translating uh, into the cell in a directional way. It's a little hard to see in the, in the movie, so let me just break it out into time points. So once the particle has found uh, the HER2 receptor, there's very little translational motion. Most of the motion just uh, slows down. And then right before it's internalized, um, you'll see that these, uh, in these circles, this, uh, it remains a bright spot. So the particle is no longer moving. It's just stuck in a fixed orientation. And then about 10 seconds later, uh, it's internalized, and then it undergoes rapid uh, directional motion with the speed uh, that's consistent with uh, motors on, for example, actin. And so it translates with the expected uh, uh, velocities for, um, when, uh, for biological motors on, on a, for example, an actin filament. So this is really neat. It's the, it's the first establishment of what are the time scales involved uh, once a, a virus or a nanoparticle or some type of agent interacts selectively with the surface and then it's internalized. And the, the mechanism of why it does this is, is also very uh, interesting, uh, but I, I won't talk about that today. Okay, and the final story, uh, I have like one minute, I'll go, I'll, I'll go, I'll speed up here, is, is related to how do we, um, how do shape effects affect the, the, the translation? But because this uh, is a meeting also related to, to light, if we, if we release the, if we use light triggered release to release the aptima from the particle surface, uh, we can see that there's a, a very large change in phenotype of the, of the nucleus, and we also find that the, the ligand can uh, thread its way through the nuclear pore complex to do uh, damage in the nucleus. So this is a really nice way to bring uh, ligands to the surface, use light, and then um, you can increase not only late stage apoptosis, but double-stranded DNA breaks. Okay, and so what we're interested in is determining the shape effects on these targeting nanoparticles. And so this is this AS1411 ligand that I just mentioned. So it means it works outside um, in these uh, larger systems. And we want to compare, does it matter whether it has a sphere shape or whether it has a star shape? So we ensured that the, uh, the chemical and physical properties were almost identical. They're as similar as, as we could get in terms of surface area, D DNA density, uh, zeta potential. Um, and then we characterize the protein corona, all these non-specific absorbed proteins on, on the particle surface, and we, can f we find that it's almost all also uh, identical. So any differences that we see in dynamics must be because of the particle geometry. Uh, we're combining a multi-wavelength differential interference contrast microscopy with epifluorescence. And the reason we ha have these multiple channels for imaging is because these uh, spheres, they're, because they're isotropic, they don't uh, they exhibit no uh, changes in terms of polarization, and therefore the, all their contrast stays the same. Okay, so what we find is that once we uh, look at how these gold nanostars with their three-dimensional shapes interact with the anticipated receptor, there's very little uh, contrast difference. Compared to if we look at the star and we've blocked the nucleolin receptor, uh, then the rotation is just is rotating all the time. Okay, so once the particle has bound to the receptor, then again, we see more restricted uh, motion, just like we saw for the HER2 system, and this is a different system. Uh, let me just show this here. Okay, so if we look at all of these um, diffusion model that I, that I showed you earlier, uh, the statistics are, are very different, uh, but uh, 
But the other thing is that we're looking at over 100 different particles, and, and this is where the single particle analysis is, is quite, uh, quite nice. So what we find out is that these different shape constructs, the stars versus the spheres, uh, they bind to different receptors. They're on the cell surface. They're not bouncing off. If, you're, if we put PEG on the surfaces, the particles are just skidding across the, the cell surface. Um, but these are, are selective based on their uh, shape. And finally, if we, if we block the um, nucleolum, you'll notice that the, these uh, statistics of the, di of the diffusion, uh, uh, translational diffusion characteristics, they're nearly uh, identical. So it matters that the, what, the, what the shape uh, looks like. So these all act like they're, they're non-targeting, they don't interact. But if we compare the, uh, this case back to, back to the star, you can see that there are very different uh, distributions in, in particle, uh, particle difference. The, the last thing I want to mention is that this, this sphere with these targeting ligands, they act like the non-targeting ligands on the star in the previous example. So even though this, they should bind, right, we have this uh, positive curvature which dis, dis, uh, displays, displays the, the nice DNA, they don't bind, so the, stars, the spheres do not bind selectively to the stars. So the anisotropic shape of the star matters a lot. Okay, so I showed you about these uh, interesting uh, shaped uh, nanoparticles that show wavelength-dependent optical properties. We can also use light as a, as a stimuli to, to release the, the drug lanes. And moreover, we can uh, observe these very interesting single particle um, nanobio interactions. There are very uh, specific differences between non-targeting and targeting anisotropic particles. And the targeting constructs of different shapes show, show different dynamics and in fact bind to different proteins. So this is really important. The, the stars with the targeting ligands maintain their function, but the spheres with the targeting ligands don't. And, and the, our best hypothesis is, or the rationale for this is that the anisotropic shape is, is the key to this. You have these branches that, that terminate uh, in three to five nanometers radius of a curvature, and they can selectively interact with the cell surface, even though they're in a sea of all sorts of other types of proteins. And this is where the nanoscale, uh, both anisotropy and the length scales are really important. Okay, so this is the, the, the group in its current form and the students that did the work they should have gold stars. <laughs> they do have gold stars. There they are. Uh, with Ting Ting, uh, Priscilla, and, and Jack. And, and I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for these wonderful insights on how single particles can interact with cells. And indeed, we have time for some questions. And I'm, yes, please. Thanks so much, Terry, for a really beautiful opening talk. Um, I thought it was neat that you could use the femtosecond laser to um, release the DNA selectively from the tips. A couple questions related to that. Um, I guess, uh, is it like a hot carrier mediated process that's breaking the gold thiol bond? And um, does it depend on like what the um, nature of the DNA is, like single-stranded, double-stranded, RNA? Like, you know, what, I guess, considerations are there for the the power and the pulse time needed based on the type of um, oligo you have attached. So the so Jen is right. It's a it's a femtosecond source and it's a hot, hot electron mediated process. So uh, the current hypothesis is that you're breaking the gold sulfur bond, and I think some of the support for that, besides work published by Mustafa El Sayed and Stefan Lake ages ago, actually, is that you still have uh, exposed gold because the second functionalization works really well. So you don't have left, it doesn't seem that you have a lot of leftover uh, uh, sulfur, you know, anything residual there. But it, turn, it also turns out, I was asked this question and I can't, def I don't have the answer, is that it could be that using this process you're just pulling the gold off from the surface. So for example, in some uh, nanofabrication processes you can print molecules and then you can use the molecules attached to that first layer of gold and you could just fizzy remove that. So I can't differentiate, but in terms of mechanistically, it seems like it's a hot electron. And then in terms of whether it matters, whether it's a single-stranded, uh, what, what the secondary structure of the oligonucleotide is, it doesn't seem to matter, at least for us right now, because we only have a single gold sulfur bond. I would expect that the, the things might be different if you have a bidentate, like if you have um, a disulfide, 
uh, bond, um, which we have wanted to try, but, but we don't know that yet. Thank you, Terry. It's uh, quite amazing how the, the work with Gold Nanostar has been evolving in, in well, your it's lab. it's inspired by some of the work that you've done, so no, it works no, no, really well. Um, very nice. <laughs> Um, I have a question connected to what Yang was asking. Um, actually, well, first a comment that uh, depending on the power of your femtosecond laser, you may also induce um, atom mobility from the tips. We, we see that. Mm -hmm. And the second is, I was a bit confused uh, because initially you showed this spectra with three modes, basically, the core mode and then one for short spikes and one for longer spikes. And the one around 800 corresponded to the short spikes, but then you're using 800, if I understood well, to deplete the DNA from the long spikes. Yeah, so there, um, okay, so the, for the heaps particles, m mostly all of the branches are the same length. Uh, and that has usually a single resonance. Uh, we can adjust the heaps concentration where all of the branches have mostly the same length except the one of them that's a little bit longer. And uh, so that's what we're using for, for these studies. So we're not using the EAPS particles because that has like a 600 nanometer resonance like a, and a 1200, but we wanted to use one that was closest. So we, we can uh, post-process the stars to access populations that mostly have mo all the same and then one long branch. And so that's what we use for, for that. Thank you. But you're right in terms of atom mobility. Uh, if we heat the particles too much, they start reshaping and they start becoming spheres. And so then that's, that's not good for us. We have time for one more question. Now, I was curious, if you caused the cells to swell, would you enable the round shape to do almost better than the, the asymmetric shapes in their accessibility to the target that you're trying to get to the cell? Oh, you mean it's the, if, the, if there was a higher curvature on the cell with the spheres? Right, because I'm just curious what's the mechanism that's allowing this asymmetrical shape to, to perform better? Yeah, I think the, our hypothesis for the mechanism is that um, you don't have a pro perfect protein corona. So unlike the, the, the spheres where it's going to be relatively uniform, uh, it's, uh, it's distributed on the particle surface. So we're doing some experiments now to visualize that. But you only need like... A, one or two DNA to, to bind to the protein. You don't need a you don't need a bunch of them. Mm. And I think on the on the tips, uh, it splays it out a little bit better than if it's on a sphere and it's really tightly packed. Because the packing of the even the packing on a sphere makes a big difference whether the spheres work or not. Maybe I can ask a very brief question that somehow might be related to it. You mentioned in your introduction that if you have the stars and you could even tune the pH in the pockets of mm -hmm. the in. This sounds like very interesting in terms of chemistry, but I'm wondering, do the cells actually care whether there's a tiny little pocket close to the core of these stars <laughs> that has a different pH? Uh, I, I don't think the cells respond that much. They don't care, but we care. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> All right, so with this, thank you very much again for your wonderful presentation. <laughs> and. Um, we now have a coffee break, but please don't run away, even so I know you've been invited to enjoy the beautiful island, because we will come back for our next plenary lecture here in 15 minutes. Thank you very much.